Bays, we're so glad to have you join with us on this, our virtual service. We get excited all the time as we realize that we are Bible based everywhere. So thank you so much for joining with us today. And thank you for inviting others to join with you to sit next to you or to invite others to be online with us. We are uh, glad on what the Lord is doing in and through us. So welcome once again to the Bible based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace right here in Tampa, Florida. We're so glad that you're viewing with us today. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have been so good and so kind, so merciful. You've extended your grace unto us and we are just thankful. We thank you, God, because we even realize that it's you who woke us up this morning and started us on our way and gives us the strength to walk through this day and to face whatever it is that come our way with you. We know that you're in control. And so now, God, we are asking that you would be with us, infiltrate our minds, hearts, our homes, our uh, iPads, our phones, whatever we're using to view you, God, you be in control of it. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your word. We want to do your word. We want to be your faithful servants. And so now, God, you have your way. Have your way through the powerful word that will be preached today. Have your way in what we'll view and hear through the songs of Zion. Have your way, God, in each of us. And so now, God, we ask that you would strengthen our pastor who will come and break forth the bread of life. Give him the words that you would have him say to us so that we might obey. We thank you. We love you. We give your name, praise, glory, and honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all said, amen. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. 
of because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth, trust the earth will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. With this faith, we will go out and adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. And we will be able to rise from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope. And this will be a great America. We will be the participants in making it so. And so as I leave you this evening, I say, walk together, children. Don't you get weary. There's a great cap meeting in the town. Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace celebrates the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. To God be the glory. The Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace Mortgage Burning Service January 31st at 8 a.m. Mark your calendar now. Well, he's in the room now. He's in the room. <laughs> Just tell somebody, he's here, he's here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Surely. Surely the breath of the Lord is in this place. Can you see the glow of glory? Can you that surely
standing on the promises of God. I love that song. I love that song. I could really play it every week. Our friends from out in Texas, uh, from uh, Resurrection Church, they call themselves the Magnification Ministry under the uh, leadership of Brother Jay Terrell. 
I thank God for that group of persons at that, that, that church. Uh, Pastor Ray Brown, just thank God for them and how they have been so uh, uh, supportive of us and come alongside of us and, and have been uh, such an encouragement to us. You know we'll be back in Genesis chapter 41 today. I know you do. And allow me to read a few more verses in your hearing just so we can uh, take off from where we left off. Beginning with verse one of Genesis chapter 41. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well favored Klein and fat fleshed and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill, favored and lean fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill favored and lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Verse eight, and it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Oh, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward. In the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And he dreamed a dream in one night. I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream, he did interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. <clears throat> then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself, and changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. Verse 15, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream. And there is none that can interpret it. And I've heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat fleshed and well favored, and they fed in a meadow. And I'll stop reading there. Would you pray with me? God, our Father, we do thank you so much for this wonderful privilege we have to once again hear your voice. Speak to us, O oh God, your servants here. We need to hear from you. If we don't hear from you, we won't know what to do. May lives be changed, 
souls won, destinies altered. Glorify yourself now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In God's own time, your change will come. Last week, we took a look at those mysterious ways of God exemplified in the life of Joseph. For the hour had struck for the emancipation of that captive. That child of God that had been in Pharaoh's prison. God moved mysteriously and God moved providentially. Joseph pulled no strings. He had tried that one time, that one time, and didn't have any success in doing so because we're told in Scripture that the butler to forgot God him. The glory. Have you ever been forgotten? After you've helped someone, after you've been a blessing to someone, after you've made their life better, that that same person forgot you? Well, for Joseph, that wasn't his first time being forgotten. For even though the days, the weeks, the months, yea, even two years went by from that forgotten, he knew how to handle forgotten because he has been in the school of discipline where God has used the discipline of delay, the discipline of distance, Oh, he has used the discipline of service and the discipline of self-control. And he has used the discipline of suffering. He's been forgotten many times. He was forgotten by his brothers, forgotten by the foreigners who purchased him from their brothers, Judah and the rest. We know them as the Midianites or the Ishmaelites. He had been forgotten by them and, and they had forgotten him because they had pawned him off to Mr. Potiphar, who also perhaps being the captain of the prison of the God, uh, but his wife, his lion wife, who probably had forgotten him by now. Both his lion wife has forgotten Joseph. Mr. Potiphar perhaps has forgotten Joseph. He's been forgotten. Forgotten by the butler. Who he told him the meaning of his dream got him his job back. Forgotten, forgotten, forgotten. Forgotten by all but his father and God. Joseph had not been forgotten by Jacob for in later chapters you will hear Jacob say Joseph is not. He thought of him every day but he thought of him as being dead. Forgotten by man but remembered by God. And now God has made his move. He began with neither baker nor butler, but with the king, the pharaoh, the monarch of that time, the king's dreams. That's where he started. There were two of them. First, he fell asleep and dreamed about cattle. Then he fell asleep again and dreamed about corn. In the first dream, he saw seven fat flourishing cows emerging from the life-giving waters of the Nile. I've been to that very place. Pharaoh looked on with approval. That is how cows ought to look, you know. He would have to appoint a new grand vizier soon to look into the condition of his cattle throughout the land. Then suddenly to Pharaoh's horror, from the same river emerged seven more cows. But what mangy, bony, puny, starved, ill-kempt, did y'all look up that word? Ill-kempt cows those were. May he never live to see such cows. 
The sweet dream had turned into a nasty nightmare. But worse, the lean and hungry cows made fierce by famine turned upon their sleek and shining kin and devoured them hoof and hide before the Pharaoh's astonished gaze. He awoke in horror, stared about him, and he fell asleep again, only to dream the same thing all over again. But this time he saw golden fields of corn, sun-kissed, good from the mountain, mountain of the jolly green giant. Now, he examined the nearest stand, seven delightful, magnificent, golden, prize-winning ears tossing proudly in the breeze beneath the smiling sun kiss. But then up sprang seven blotched and blighted ears, spinely nightmare ears. Those turned upon their flourishing neighbors and devoured them stalk and stem. Pharaoh awoke in fresh horror, convinced now that the dreams were a sign. But what could they mean? That's when we're told of the king's distress. Having dreamed those dreams that troubled him and fueled such a quagmire, he went about a search to find answers. What meaneth the dreams? What was the meaning of the cows and the corn? What is the answer to this mystery? And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, what I call all the king's horses and all the king's men. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there were none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. What a scene that turned out to be because these were hired wise men. But there the wise men stood in their distinctive robes and their regalia embroidered with mystical signs, the scholars, the sages, men who are learned in the lore of dreams. They listened intently as Pharaoh told his dreams. They pondered the meaning of the dream, the magicians and wise men did not have the answers. And so they were not stumped to no end. They turned to the little G God called thought. T H O T. It was the turn of the God thought thought to speak to his priests so that they might make known to the mystery of the Pharaoh the meaning of the dream. Stay with me, if you will, because the Egyptian little G God thought, thought, T-H-O-T, did not give any answers to pacify this Pharaoh. And he got more and more wroth, more and more angry. But that was the liturgy God of dreams and wisdom. That was the scribe of the Egyptian gods. The Egyptians believed he invented hieroglyphics, writings, mathematics, language, and magic. Thot was the liturgy god of magical arts. It was Thot who knew the mystic names of all of the other liturgy gods, what it was that made the other liturgy gods afraid and with what mystic rites they could be subdued. Thot. Thot could give his worshipers powers to dominate Osiris and Anubis and, of course, Set. He was the little G God of inspiration with the incantations and prayers taught by thought. One little G God could be frightened by the terror of another. 
the magicians of Egypt therefore turned to their magical tricks to conjure from thought the secret of the Pharaoh's dreams. He is the one who control the seasons, the moon, the stars, but they were up against the true and living God, the big G God now, a God who could not be coerced, a God who could not be cajoled, a God who could not be cowed. That, that failed the Pharaoh because there is no thought. There's only one true and living God of who is the Lord of the heavens, Pharaoh was about to learn this very lesson too. Pharaoh himself, an initiate into the mysteries, watched anxiously as his ministers went to their con consultations and their incantations. His spirits fell as with embarrassment and bewilderment, they confessed themselves defeated. They came with that one pharaonic formula. O oh, king, they cried. That's the ritual formula of the pharaonic court. O oh, king, life, prosperity, health. We confess ourselves baffled. Thought gives no answer. The Pharaoh must seek elsewhere for the meaning of his dreams. It's all God. God's providential hand is about to set God's servant, Joseph, free. And so in the providential ways of God, the ground was prepared for the coming of Joseph. Pharaoh's distress must have been evident to everybody because they knew that when Pharaoh get to where the Pharaoh looked like he was getting, he could really cause pandemonium in the kingdom. He would kill, kill, kill. His dreams, who could interpret his dreams? They can't help him. Who will help him solve this dilemma? And may I suggest to you before I, I move to uh, the rapid close, that that's what's wrong with this old world in which we live in now. The presidents, the governors, the mayors, the chief of police, uh, the president's councils, the president's cabinet, uh, the parties, the non-parties, the everybody who's in charge, they think they're in charge. They don't get it, but they're going to have to understand that the wise men of this world do not hold the solution to the unrest in our communities. The wise men of this world do not hold the answer to the pandemics, nor the epidemics, nor the outbreaks, nor the outcries. They do not have the solution to the unrest in our communities. And many of you who are now dialing the 1-800 numbers and the 1-900 numbers and the 999 numbers and the 888 numbers, trying to see what Dion has to say trying to see what the Ouija board has to say. Ouija, can you hear me? Those of us in this day and age who look to see what Uncle Sandy says, who, who talk about I'm Leo and she's Cleo and, 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 and your cycle is high today. No, 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 no. I got friends who talk about I depend heavily on what they call reality TV. Reality TV can't break the chain of social injustices, systemic evils. Judge Judy can't do it. Judge Mathis can't do it. Old People's Court can't do it. I just thought I'd help y'all though. I got a friend who thinks so, so highly of what is seen in the so-called 
reality TV. Maybe they can tell me how to solve my problem, she says. Or maybe they can tell me how I can land a good catch, like so-and-so, she says. Maybe, maybe, maybe they can tell me how to be a better husband, he says. Or maybe they can tell me how to get my wife to do better. Tell me how to be a better husband. Maybe they can tell me how to get my head on right. Maybe they can tell me how to get ahead on my job. I, I hear it all the time. Come here. Let's peep into Pharaoh's situation. He'll tell you. People, people, I hired the greatest minds. I hired the scholars of all time. I had on my staff the magicians par excellent. I made it a point to fill my cabinet. I appointed them all to help me. Keep in on what Pharaoh has to say. Because what Pharaoh did is what he should have done. He came to that place. If they can't help me be the leader that I need to be, I'll just start eliminating them. That's why when you get to chapter 41, verses 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, you begin to see the perfect wisdom of God. And then you'll get to see the peerless will of God. Watch, watch what happens because standing right there holding the cup was the cup bearer. Right there near Pharaoh's throne, a part of his high official court, the king's cup bearer. Joseph's old friend who had forgotten about him, Mr. Butler himself. He had listened to the king's dreams told. He had watched the frustration and the fury in the king. He saw the trembling and he heard the rattle in his voice and he saw that the king is about to do a blood purge. And he sits there and he thinks, oh no, oh no. And all of a sudden, just like he got acute amnesia two years ago and forgot Joseph, it all started coming back to him. It all came back to him. He saw himself back down there in that cold prison cell, perhaps shuddered at the thought and shied away from it. But the thought kept coming back to him. You remember you were in prison? He remembered his dream and he remembered that both he and the baker had had dreams. And he remembered the nice looking Hebrew boy, slave though he was, who had been elevated to run in the prison and helping the other uh, prisoners there and who had ministered even to himself, couldn't remember his name. What was that fella's name? What was that fella's name? I need to get in touch with that fella. I need, them, I need to at least tell the Pharaoh about his name. Uh, and when all seemed hopeless, the silence was broken by the butler of Pharaoh. He says, I got it. My memory came back. I got it. 
he confidently shared with his master the incident of his imprisonment of two years ago and that he met Joseph. That's his name, Joseph. Joseph, he was a Hebrew. Joseph, Joseph, he was a Hebrew slave. Joseph, Joseph, my memory is coming back. He was an accurate interpreter of dreams. Yeah, God in his timing has caused the forgotten one to be the remembered one. Another day in the dungeon was about to become very special. Stepping forward, Mr. Butler made his obeisance before Pharaoh and told his royal master of that incident from the past. Joseph, 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 that's his name. The young man was at one time, my Lord, slave to Potiphar, captain of your majesty's guard. And perhaps Potiphar may have been there. I don't know. I don't know. If so, his eyebrows stood up like that. Oh, oh, that boy, that boy who who, 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 who went after my wife, that boy, that boy who raped, uh, that boy, uh, 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 and, and, and the butler knew about him, the butler knew about it. It must have shot a sudden chill through Mr. Potiphar's heart. He too owed so much to Joseph. He had perhaps been too hasty and acting on the story of his lying, good-looking wife, his face would have been a sight to behold. Wish it could have been there. Wish it could have been there to see his face. What an exhibit we have here of the perfect timing of God. What an apologetic could be written on the timings of God in the affairs of men. I'm in here all alone. I would, if, if, if any of y'all were here, I would call you by name. I would say, Jenny, what you got here? I would say, Tony, what you got here? I would say, Miss Betty, Miss Betty, what you got here? If one had the historical perspective and sufficient mastery of the facts, what a book could have been written. What a book could be written to challenge agnosticism, to challenge atheists. One would begin perhaps with Galatians 4.4 4, where Paul said, but in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. So it was that God displayed his perfect wisdom in the perfect timing of the events of Joseph's life. Not a moment too soon, not a moment too late, but in the very fullness of the time, God got busy. Pharaoh was ready. His dreams saw to that. Joseph was ready. I know he was ready. 13 years of iron discipline in a very hard school saw to that. Oh, the butler was ready. The butler was ready. Enough time had passed for him to speak of his imprisonment without fear. Twelve years in a, is a long time to us. I got some friends and some onlookers and some viewers and some who hear of our series in God's own time. Uh, your change will come. Some of them are incarcerated. And you, I want to share to you, my brother, with you, my brother. I want to share with you, my incarcerated sisters. I want to let you know that even in your prison, even in your situation, in God's own time, your change will come. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone short as the watch that ends the night. Twelve years is a long time to us, but it's nothing to God before the rising sun. Forgotten by man. Forgotten by the public defender. Forgotten by the paid attorney. Forgotten by the witnesses who knows, who knows, who knows. Forgotten by the partners in crime. Remembered by God. It's all I'm saying. It's all I'm saying. God had not forgotten Joseph. He was working to a timetable. That was all. And in God's own time, your 
change will come. I tell you, in God's own time, it'll come, it'll come. Joseph is now 30 years old. He left home, a 17 year old teenager. And if his daddy had known that it would be some 24 years before he'd see him again, oh yeah, do the time and do the math. For 13 years now, Joseph has had nothing but one wave after another, one wind after another, one, one rug being snatched out from him and another. What do you do when everywhere you turn, it looks like there's 13 years of criticism of you, 13 years of conflict for you, 13 years dealing with crisis, 13 years dealing with confrontations, 13 years having to deal with chaos, 13 years of calamity, 13 years of delays. God's delays are not his denials. And so you have to understand the perfect timing of God. Because that's the only way you will get to appreciate the perfect tactics of God. Look at him. First, he awakened in Pharaoh a tremendous sense of the supernatural of impending doom, of coming disaster. All turned up to a fine pitch by the failure of his own staff his magicians, his own cabinet, his sorcerers, his own soothsayers, we call them. He awakened thus in Pharaoh dissatisfaction and disillusionment with the experts and made him receptive to whatever Joseph might have to say. God, when God is in it, you don't have to pull no coattails of key men when God has his hands on you. You don't have to hope that, 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 that somebody trip up. No, 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 no. By the time those preliminaries were over, the stage was fully set for the entrance of Joseph. The atmosphere was right for him to carry everything before him, both Pharaoh and the court. And it was all done so smoothly and naturally. Only God. What is more natural than a dream? God works behind the scenes and in seemingly ordinary ways works out his sovereign will. In verses 1 through 8 of chapter 41, I've shown you the providential ways of God. In verses 9 through 13, I'm trying to show you the perfect wisdom of God. And may God help us in verses 14 through 44, you'll get to see the peerless will of God. It was God's peerless will to elevate Joseph to a position of great power in the world. He had shown that will to Joseph in his boyhood dreams, his spectacular dreams while he was wearing his splendid dress and while he was conducting himself with his spiritual drive. The long years of discipline and development had been designed to prepare Joseph for the high post now to be his. What are you doing in God's preparation of you for what God has promised you, for what God has prepared for you? You can't have it prematurely. Because if you get it prematurely, you'll mess it up or it will mess you up. Yeah. It was therefore the peerless will of God to present Joseph to Pharaoh. Next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, a switcheroo again. Y'all missed it last week, didn't you? You missed it last week, didn't you? It was one way and then I did that on purpose because I don't want us to think that it takes God a long time to do anything. It's just that quick. And if you blink, you'll miss it. And if you stop trusting God, you'll miss it. And if you stop hoping in God, you'll miss it. 
If you get in too big of a hurry, you'll miss it. It's they that wait upon the Lord whose strength will be renewed. It's they that wait upon the Lord who will mount up with wings like eagles. It's they who wait upon the Lord who will have wings like eagles and be able to run and not be weary and walk and not faint. You got to wait on God. Joseph waited on God. Joseph trusted in God. Joseph hoped in God. Joseph remained faithful to God no matter whether he was in the pit or in the prison. He waited and trusted in God. And here's Pharaoh. If such a guy is like that, bring him in here and bring him in here now. Can't you see them rushing, rushing downstairs in the prison? And because Joseph is in the soil clothing and Joseph is looking all with overgrowth and he had to shave. They had to shave him in a hurry because hair on the face of uh, to e an Egyptian was an insult. To stand before the Pharaoh with hair on your face. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, Rodney, you couldn't stand before the, the Pharaoh. I couldn't stand before the Pharaoh. We, brother, would have to stay down in the prison unless... We were really willing to get shade. I think I'm trying to say something to somebody other than me and Rodney. You can't go before the Pharaoh looking any kind of way, britches hanging down, half drunk, half stank, looking all a uh, Google eyed and expect the king to know who you are. And they cleaned up Joseph. Joseph, hurry up and get ready. Hurry up and get dressed. You're going to get me to lose my job if you don't hurry up. The king want to see you. The king want to see you. What do you want to see me for? He don't know. What do you want to see me for? Joseph had not been anticipating this move. Because if he had, he would have been ready to go. Joseph is not thinking, oh, the butler finally got around to after two years. But he finally got around to telling him, telling him about me. He's not even thinking that way. Once his name was brought before Pharaoh, things moved very quickly. Can't you see it? There was Joseph in his prison rags, bustling to and fro on his many errands that he's been doing all day. He was a right-hand man for the prison governor. Perhaps he was inducting a whole new uh, 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 convict. Uh, 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 he, was, he was bringing another person into the prison, going through his routine. Looking over his checklist to make sure he didn't miss anything. Oh, maybe he was preparing the noonday meal. I've heard from some people that I know personally uh, who, who have been moved up or elevated to be in trustees. And they, they, they think very highly of, of, of being able to, uh, to warm the lunch or to serve, distribute the lunch. They think themselves to be having it, 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 it a whole lot better by being out of trouble while you're incarcerated. I think I'm trying to say something to uh, all of y'all that I know. What was he doing? Well, his name is called, they're hustling him up, telling him to hurry up, get ready. They shave him, change his clothes. They put on these garbs. Pharaoh wants you. The Pharaoh wants me? Whatever for? I don't know. I don't know something about a dream. Hurry up, man. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry. You can get me. You can get us killed. Do you want me to lose my head, man? Come on. So Joseph arrayed in his court garments, ready to go to court. Brothers, sisters, when you go to court, don't go looking like you mad and angry and ain't got nothing on your side and don't know what to do. Present yourself. I ain't telling you to look phony and false. Present yourself before the authorities. Let them know you do have it. You got them all. And when Joseph gets upstairs, guess what? On the throne before him was a man with keen, penetrating eyes. Bare, muscular arms. Yeah. A regal carriage and proud stallions. A man wearing the double crown that for a thousand years had symbolized the union of upper and lower Egypt. Sitting on that throne, on the imperial brow, was the twin insignia of the two lands, 
the falcon and the serpent. In one hand was the crook for upper Egypt. In the other, the flail for lower Egypt. Bible base. Fellowship. Bible base. That's why I come to Bible base. Because I want to see what's in the Bible. I want to understand the Bible. The Pharaoh was probably arrayed in a long fluted skirt made of priceless Egyptian linen. He had golden sandals on his feet. Such was the Pharaoh. A man supposed to be a little G-God. The incarnation of ra ah, ra a capital R, a small a, ra a man whose functions were as much religious as political. Sent for Joseph on that day when Joseph wasn't expecting him. Up from the prison, Joseph, and there upon his throne, weighed down with this heavy crown, and by the regalia of royalty is the Pharaoh, the king. He saw before him a man occupying a position satisfied by over 1,500 years of unbroken tradition. Joseph, however, saw the trappings of power. Woo! He saw a lost, lonely man with a soul needing to be saved. He saw that that soul was ripe, R-I-P-E, to do what was right, R-I-G-H-T. Joseph walks in and stands before the king, and the king says, I'm in trouble. My spirit is troubled, and I heard you can help me. My dreams, young man, can you interpret them? Can you interpret them? He demanded. The all important moment had come. And look at what a moment it is for Joseph to take the credit for himself. Oh, how Satan wants to rip you and rip us of our one opportunity to be the witness. For our God, every day it happens, every day it happens. Satan whispers in our ears and say, take the credit for it. Take, act like you did it. Act like you're the one that made it happen. Act like you were smart enough to get it done, not for Joseph. Joseph looks at him very humbly. He says, can you or not? You got to say something, Joseph, because he'll have your head off as soon as he look at you. If you insult him before all these people. Oh, but Joseph ain't calling the, the Pharaoh names, ain't screaming at the Pharaoh, ain't rolling all that, acting all crazy with the bailiff and the rest of the people in the courtroom and showing everybody how bad they are with chains on their hands already and chains on their No, 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 no. Joseph had not been in God's school all those years for nothing. He didn't go to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. He didn't go to FAMU, BCC, or Howard. He did not get to go to the University of Athens, the University of Alexander, or the University of Tarsus. No, he went to the University of Pharaoh's prison. And because he was humble enough and strong enough not to listen to the father of lies, as John 8, 44 calls him, the Pharaoh was warm hearted. Young man, can you interpret my dreams? And Joseph answered the Pharaoh saying, oh, I love this story. It is not me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Y'all, you already see it's not, it, it ain't gonna happen. You already see it. It ain't gonna happen today. But let me rush to my close. Joseph says, it is God who shall give you peace. The dream of Pharaoh is one. Tell me your dream. He tells him the dream. You and I read the dream. You and I have heard the dream. We read the dream. We know the dream. 
Listen at Joseph. God hath shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. First, the word of Bible testimony in which Pharaoh was dethroned and the true and the living God put in absolute control. Then the unfolding of Pharaoh's dream. Joseph said, I can't do it. God will. Only God can. Only God has the power to interpret your dream. Dream book. Tell me your dream. And I'm glad I'm God's mouthpiece. Watch this because it's all God. Pharaoh is going to be the agent of fulfilling Joseph's boyhood promise from God. Oh, Pharaoh, I'll tell you what your dream means. Now that God has revealed it to me. They both mean the same thing. The seven, the number seven, the seven, the seven represents seven years. You're going to have seven great years of plenty. The land will be prosperous. The land will flourish. But then you're going to have seven years of famine. Seven years of starvation. Oh, having read to Pharaoh the meaning of his dreams, a meaning obvious to everyone the moment Joseph produced the key. Joseph went on to read Pharaoh a short lesson in economics. Mm -hmm. He advised the king to appoint a man discreet and wise and to set that man over the land of Egypt to husband the harvest of the plenteous years against the years of want and woe. So Pharaoh, what you better do is put a plan in place so you can store up all you can store up in the first seven years, I got to do something with this number seven. This number seven keeps popping up. It just pops up all over this passage, all, all, all over this story. He says, you got, you, 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 you got to get somebody who's smart enough, intelligent enough, got the integrity, honest enough, and, 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 and knows what they're doing. That in the first seven years, they do what must be done so it will last you over the seven rough years. He said, now you need to get you somebody and put them in charge of your agricultural ministry. You need a secretary of agriculture and let that person set up commissioners around the land so that you can lay up and store up during the seven years of plenty for the seven years of famine. I better do this seven because I see, I see, I see time. To, uh, it, it's done. It's done. It's done. There's some numerical insights from chapter 41 about the number seven. The number seven is plastered all over this chapter. Have you been hearing it? Have you been seeing it? Read them when you get a chance. In fact, the number seven appears 28 times, four times seven in this chapter. Seven fat and lean cows, seven full and lean ears of corn. Number three, seven years of plenty. Number four, seven years of famine. Number five, seven groups of people, uh, uh, Pharaoh, uh, Joseph, the butler, the magicians and wise men, Joseph's two sons, a zenith and part of Pharaoh, the starving Egyptians and other countries. Number six, seven new things Joseph received, a signet ring, fine linen. We don't get to that till next week. It's in next week's message, but you'll see all seven of them, a signet ring, fine linen clothing, gold chain around his neck. I'm gonna find one. Y'all, can somebody loan me a gold chain? I don't have one to hold me down like that. 
Ooh, that that may, reminded me of something about somebody who used to have a chain with somebody's senior class ring around the chain and that, that ch senior, senior class ring on that chain wearing their head and down and walking all around. That gold chain going to be around Joe's neck next, 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 next week. There's going to be a chariot and then a wife and then two children, a new position, grand vizier of Egypt. He'll be the Hebrew word for seven is Shava, Shava, S-H-E-V-A-H, which is the, uh, from the Hebrew root word Sava, Sava, S-A-V-A-H, which means to be full, to be satisfied, or to have enough of something. You got to get this, get this, get this. The meaning of seven is dominated by this root of, for seven is the number of spiritual perfection or completion. God rested on the seventh day because the creation was full and complete. And in this chapter, chapter 41, Joseph's major trials and testings have come to an end as he is promoted from the prison to the palace. Goodbye, Bible base. May the Lord God bless you real good. May those of you who have joined in with us during this virtual service, however you caught this uh, message, I know you know that this is number eight. And so there's seven others that came before it. Spiritually, God had brought Joseph to a great level level of maturity as Joseph discerned God's hand in his life and in his trials. Joseph was able to forgive and not take revenge against those who abused him because he had learned this important truth. He learned it is the discipline. He learned it in the discipline of service. He learned it in the discipline of self-control. You can't lead nobody else and you can't run nobody else until you learn how to manage you. I used to tell my grandson that all the time. I say, son, you're all right around me, but but you need to know how to be all right when you're not around me. Yeah, I tell you, you got to learn those things in the discipline of service. And you learn those things in the discipline of self-control. And you learn those things like Joseph. In the discipline of suffering, Joseph's advice to Pharaoh was to pick out a wise and discreet man to gather 20%. I'm going to talk next week about the 80-20 rule. Yes, I am, because he says you need somebody to gather 20% of the harvest for storage during the seven years of plenty. And Pharaoh discerns that God's spirit is in Joseph. Ooh we. It's something when the world can see Jesus in you. It's something when the world can hear Jesus in you. It's something when the world can testify themselves that God is in you. Pharaoh discerns that God's spirit is in Joseph and chooses him for the task of leadership. He wasn't recommended by nobody. It's the spirit of God that gets you in the place where you need to be suffering 101. This is the first mention in scripture of God's spirit indwelling a man. And on that note, I'll tell you, I don't care where you're at. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how long you've been suffering. I don't care. Godliness pays. Godliness pays. You see what happened to Joseph, don't you? The Pharaoh makes Joseph grand vizier of Egypt and places upon him all of the stuff I'm going to tell you about next week. The fine linen, the gold chain. I'm going to spend extra minutes on that signet ring. Oh, I don't know why I don't wear my jewelry. I don't like stuff weighing me down. I'm going to wear my watches. I got a couple of watches that I need to wear, one on each arm. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In God's own time, your change will come. In God's own time, your change will come. God, our Father, thank you so much for this series that even when we break away from it and come back to it, you're always sending us a relevant message. Oh God, we revere you for being that God who requires reverence even in the midst of our relevance. Oh God, I pray that this sermon, this message 
even the songs that have gone forth today, I pray that they have reached someone that have caused them to recognize your word and to receive your word and to respond to your word in their own hearts that they may rush to do what your word says. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus suffered, bled, and died for us, paid for our sins, and need we only but to trust your word that says if we shall confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and shall believe in our hearts that you have raised Jesus from the grave, we shall be saved. Lord, will you save someone today? Will you, O oh God, restore someone today? Lord, rescue the perishing, we pray in Jesus' name. Even as you add to the church, virtual though we may be, we thank you for persons all around the world who are coming to know you in a real and personal way, persons all around the world who are hearing your great truth and then crying out, what must I do to be saved? Thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, I hate to stop, and I know you don't want me to stop right there, but I had to stop. But would you do this? Share it with somebody. Like us on your various platforms. Follow us, if you will. And don't like us so much that you create a page for us and try to harm us. God's spirit controls what's going on here. That's why we are like we are. It's time that you take this information that we are flashing for you. It's called the invitation. Use the number and call us. Let us let us help you come to know the Lord in a real and personal way. Use this list, these little email addresses. Let us hear from you. And someone will respond to you immediately. All right? Listen, feeling good like I'm feeling good? I'm feeling good knowing that for somebody else, just like in next week's message, I'll personalize some of it and let you know how I really know that in God's own time, even after all the hell I went through, my change did come. Ooh, I can't hardly wait. I might give that sermon a special name. Um, Bible base, it's time for the offering. Praise the Lord. Listen, would you be faithful? It's a new year. Yes, it is. It's a new month. Yes, it is. It's the first month in this new year. Would you start this year out a little better than you've already started out? Be faithful. Would you bring the tithe into the storehouse? Bring it by the church, 8718 North 46th Street. Mail it to the church, uh, 8718 North 46th Street. 33617 or mail it to the P.O. Box, P.O. Box 290698. Slow that down. P.O. Box 290698. Know how I remember that? Because that's the longest P.O. Box address I ever had to remember. And I was the one that opened that box. Um, I don't know. Maybe Iris opened it, but one of us did it. It was back in the day. That's coming up on January 31st when we talk about our history, when we are celebrating the paying off of the mortgage of the church. I got to tell y'all how this church got mortgage to start with. But I want to tell you, through the faithful giving over the years, not just in 2020, um, uh, the Christmas for Christ. No, we didn't reach our goal. We're still working on the goal. But guess what? Because of the faithfulness of those who started with us, 
Some have died. Some have changed churches. Some have gone on. Some don't go nowhere. nowhere. Oh, wait. Y'all t- find out where these people, just because we're not meeting at the church, we're still church. Oh, we're church everywhere. You hear Dr. Jenny saying it every Sunday. We are Bible-based everywhere. Listen, all of what God told us in year one, that he was going to break the ministry in the pieces and that we were going to uh, be uh, multi uh, generational, multi uh, uh, racial. We're going to be multi uh, all of the multi that we would have multi locations. Look at what God did. Wherever you are, he's made a location. Didn't know what he was talking about then. Don't really know all of what he's saying now. But I know what I'm saying to him. I'm saying to him, we are ready to reboot. And God's will be done in 2021. Hey, listen, P.O. Box 29069. You thought I was lost. I'm not lost. I just have so much that I want to say in such a short frame of time. Uh, Listen, P.O. Box 29069833687. Yeah, it's a little different from the street address. When you do the street address, 8718 North 46th Street, the zip is 33617. When you send it to the P.O. Box, P.O. Box 290698, the zip is 33687. Y'all got all of that? Whoo, I'm out of breath. Listen, um, make sure you pay attention to the uh, um, announcements we have. That's the fastest way and the best way we have to let you know what, what's going on. And if the weather is right and if the timing is right and if God says the same on eight o'clock at eight o'clock a.m. January 31st at the church in the parking lot, come as you are, stay in your car. However, we don't do it. We're going to celebrate like uh, Fred Hammond say it's time to celebrate uh, our Savior and his love. And that's what we're going to do. And we're not going to leave nobody out because you left uh, it up for a few people to finish off. There was some who did when they wasn't trying to do. And some who refused to do when they could have done. But God said 2020, he was going to take care of it and he did. Got another surprise, but I'm not going to tell y'all about it. I'm going to let you see it. And I'm going to let you see what God is doing because of our commitment to not be merely curiosity seekers, but converted, committed children of God. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us now and forever. Amen.
To God be the glory. The Bible Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace, Mortgage Burning Service, January 31st at 8 a.m. Mark your calendar now. Temple Terrace celebrates the life and legacy.